Thanks, thanks, Tom. Um, so, th it's a little bit artificial. Uh, my intent would be to make this seem like we were just sitting at a bar after a couple of drinks, and I would be. Able I hated that film. Yeah, <laughs> right. But these are very, very, very cagey uh, individuals. They're going to try to stonewall me, and I'm going to try to be obnoxious. I think to try to get them to say opinionated things. Because, um, yeah, knowledge is power, and they, they, they like to keep it very close to the vest. So we're, we're going to try, try to do this. Um, let's just start talking about uh, the mission statement for, for this panel, which is let's, let's get a temperature reading on where you think we are. What, what's this historical moment in nonfiction film right now, um, if something comes to mind? I mean, it's a, to my perspective, you know, we're living during a... Very, very exciting time. Some people have called it the golden age. Some people would disagree. There's so many approaches under the sun right now. I mean, you can range from essay films to you know direct cinema type films to like films that are doing chimeric or hybrid work, performative pieces. We all can put titles under each of these each of these categories. Um, so, how how can you? give us a coherent sense for this big, messy world of nonfiction right now. Basil, do you want to jump yeah, in? That's, that's to me. Uh, wow, starting off easy. Um, you know, I, I think it is exactly what you said. There's a lot of different approaches and a lot of uh, different um, ways of, of looking at documentary nonfiction that uh, we are dealing with audiences that are tending to be more educated about what nonfiction can be, not have a very fixed idea of it being one specific kind of history channel sort of thing. Not that there's anything wrong with the history channel. Um, but uh, so I, I do think that there is, uh, you know, there there is a golden age of, in a sense, um, in in the sense that um, there is so much going on, and we can figure out different ways to um, to position different films in our, our festival contacts within different kinds of sections um, to sort of signal to the audience that you know these kinds of films over here are a little bit different from these over here, but they're all within that nonfiction rubric, which is which is exciting, um, so that we're we're not sort of like showing the same kind of film constantly. God, okay. Um, I do think it's a really exciting time. Um, my feeling is the audience has always been there. I think we've undersold them a little bit. Um, there's always been this view that there isn't this huge audience for documentary, but I've always believed that there has been, but they just haven't been able to get access to the film. So I think what's great is seeing that we have way more ways of getting these films to people now and seeing that actually audiences are really responding. So I think you know they've been actually asking us to show us these films for a really long time and we've now just figured out how to do that. Um, so I'm really excited to see that move forward and a lot of the companies putting money behind documentaries again. Like We had a bit of a slow bit and it seems to be coming back. Um, and I think you know the artistry in documentary is coming back too, which I think is really exciting. I think we kind of got hijacked a little bit um, over the last decade and the idea of you know documentary being a tool which it is an incredible tool and I like the fact that artistry is now coming back into the fold as, as being as much of a big importance of documentary as the, the power of it. Did you want to add, add anything to that or? Uh, I just n n the only the sense that sometimes I feel like there are more people who want to make films. People are more invested in what they want to make rather than what they're watching. And I think that's a trend that's been happening over a number of years. And it, you, you see it a lot with documentary, too, because of the, the, the tools have become so accessible. So people are very interested in telling their story. Um, and then it's interesting how that translates into what they're actually, what other people's stories that they want to say. But not that the, I'm not making a judgment about that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just kind of interesting to notice that as the numbers keep exploding, I don't know if anybody realizes how many other people are kind of doing the same thing that they're doing. I think. Someone just a few weeks ago tallied that there were more than 7,000 documentaries um, in 2013 that are on IMDb. So that gives you a sense for the sort of torrent that we're, we're working with. I, I want to go back to uh, what, what Charlotte said, which was this, you're, you're feeling like right now there's a turn back to artistry. You're, you're saying that for the decade preceding perhaps the last year or two, you felt like the films that were being made were driven by foundations and grants. Do you, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, I think it's, documentary is one of the most powerful art forms, and I, I, that's part of the reason that I love it. I think 
you know, if anyone's seen The Look of Silence, it's the perfect example of a film that is, shows the power of documentary. It shows that you know, a fiction film could not create that level of power, so it's completely understandable that people want to utilize that. Um, and I think that's wonderful. But I also think, you know, if you look at the history of documentary, it's incredibly artistic. It's different ways of showing the world. And I love that we're seeing much more of a breadth of approach of how we are doing that now. Um, and I also think that because of the technology, which is a huge thing both in fiction and documentary, Filmmakers are being much more innovative, and I think a lot of very creative filmmakers are coming into documentary because maybe we're a bit broader in our scope of what filmmaking is. Um, so we're seeing a lot of innovation come through documentary that then filters into fiction, I think. So it's a really interesting kind of pool for creativity right now. If you were, if you were here at the keynote yesterday, Michael Moore um, was saying inflammatory uh, remarks. One of the best things he said was, let's get rid of the word documentarian and, and by extension documentary. You, if you are entering this field, you are making movies. Like, let's forget about these, these sort of, you know, inexact uh, dividing lines. Do, do, do any of you have a, have a comment, uh, a rejoinder to, to Michael? I, mean, my, I say this and people always give me like a real terrible face when I say this, but I hope in my lifetime there are no documentary film festivals. There, there will be no? Yeah. Doc because I want them to be seen on the same level as fiction films. I just want film festivals. And right now we have them because we need them, because we need to showcase this work and get it out there. But I want us films to be films. And documentary isn't still seen on that level, and I really hope it does. Right, right now it's like films with training wheels. <laughs> It, it, there's definitely, you know, I mean, that, that, the whole conversation of documentary truth is, you know, a juicy one and can go on right away. And I just feel, having been, a, as somebody who watched films, I didn't notice it. It was only when I was involved with the documentary as a subject that I really understood the full force of how there's a total narrative structure imposed on any film. And Fred Wiseman talks about this quite eloquently. You know, any filmmaker is making a decision in every moment about what they're covering and that there's no truth. There's documentary truth. There's a filmmaking truth. There's no actual truth on film. It, there just isn't. So I'm with the idea that you know the best documentary. We we use a term internally like narrative and documentaries, and I hate it because it's like the best documentaries have the best narratives. They have to have a narrative, even it's even if it's a intuit, you know, an associative one. So yeah, I'm, I I think it's just definitely great storytelling, great filmmaking, and it doesn't really matter. Scripted you, or not. You grimaced when well, I... Well, I, I mean, I, I definitely hear... Like, for years I ran an LGBT festival, and we always would say, I want to live for that day where we don't need LGBT film festivals anymore because they're in integrated within the realm of all film, film, film festival experiences. You don't have to single them out and sort of ghettoize. Um, so I definitely respect that aspect of it. But at the same time, I mean, I... While I can appreciate sort of the slippage between documentary fiction and nonfiction in terms of hybrids and, and all that kind of stuff, um, I, you know, part of me gets very sort of defensive and I kind of want to know that I am watching something documentary truth, even if it's not truth truth. You know, like I, I, I don't want to have to guess what subject is telling the truth versus what is scripted and what is not, you know, not truth. Um, and so for, for that reason, I kind of do feel like I like the distinction sometimes to be a little bit more um, distinctive. Oh, I'm, not a, I'm not against the distinction. I just want the industry at large and the public Absol to approach. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, when, whenever, you know, Tom mentioned my, my, my blog that I do, and, you know, I, I sort of do overviews of, of different festivals, uh, mainstream as well as doc-specific, and I'm always counting up, like, you know, Cannes has six documentaries out of, you know, whatever, 50 films, and that is weird to me. Like, I think that there should be an equity there where, just like Charlotte's saying. Um, but, you know, getting rid of the term documentary, getting rid of the idea of that as a distinction is, is a little strange for me. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a tricky thing. Do, do, do either of you believe in sort of truth in advertising? Should there be some sort of label at the beginning or the end of the film saying, oh, you know, the, this, uh, this character was introduced into the scene who, who didn't exist before, or, you know, this was choreographed, or this was scripted. What, what, what's your thoughts on this? I, I'm actually going to just punt on that for a few minutes. Okay. Just thinking about it. I'm the only festival here, because we're supposed to be sort of, you know, a little bit talking about our festivals as opposed to, I think, the, the greater documentary stuff, I, I think. So you, these, you three are all... Um, documentary specific festivals and I work at a festival that's not. So in terms of labeling, we do have categories. Um, we do have categories and then we have, we have at least one specific category that we created where there are no lines. 
so that it was, it's, it's the visions category, right. and it can be for docs or for narratives or for hybrids, because we, you know, it, it, it just, it's not relevant. It's sort of innovative filmmaking in general, There's something kind of edgy or DIY about it. And I'm always kind of, you know, it's, an, it's a conversation we have internally all the time about how much we have to label which films are documentaries, um, in, let's say in the music category, because some are, though, or the international one. So, and we have defaulted to as much as possible labeling it. Your, your question, what your, uh, that's, I can't open my mind to that right now. I don't know. I'll have to really think about that. Janet closed down the South by Southwest party at 4 a.m., so <laughs> we're going to give her a pass on that. Charlotte? And I think that trying to define what a documentary is is like the eternal pretzel that we spend half of our time discussing. Um, and I love the discussions because they're really fun, and I think we all have very different takes, and that's part of the fun. I mean, in our programming team, we often go down a real deep hole of like what we can consider a documentary. Um, and I love that discussion, and I, but I do, it's such a hard one to say because I do think audiences do like to know what they're seeing to a certain point, but I don't want us to limit ourselves. So I don't know the answer to this question, but... I, lo I mean, I love the fact that documentary can be so many things. That's what, I, what draws me to it. Um, but I do think we have to respect the audience at the same time, so I don't know. Well, it's like you guys, last year, True False, you showed Boyhood. And uh, so, so True False is a you know, documentary festival, except you'd love to push it. And it's interesting, because Boyhood is something that, you know, a director who has made some documentaries, but he's, he is a, has a real specific vision that he wants. He has actors, he works strongly on what that is. And it makes sense that Boyhood would have been included in that because it is so based in realness. It's so authentic. And, it's and it has the 12-year the sort of longitudinal aspect of it. I just saw right. this, this article, I um, forget what, what magazine, but Richard actually mentioned the decision to put it in true-false. He was, he was against it because mm -hmm. he didn't want it to be tainted with that, you know, nonfiction label. I could imagine as, a, yeah. as the director who had the vision for it that, that that's not what, what he would have wanted. So that's, I think, it's yeah. a really, I can understand from your perspective why you did it, why you thought it was juicy, and I can absolutely see why for him it would have been less right. so. Yeah, that's interesting. If, uh, if anyone out there in the blinding light uh, wants to uh, ask a question, uh, please find one of the orange people in the, uh, the TIFF TIFF t-shirts, and uh, I believe they, they do have mics. We, we do have a, a hand in the back row already. Um, so maybe we'll interject a question here and there if you, if you all want to participate. All right. Hi. Um, I was just wondering from any of you, of you what in all the submissions you're getting now, what pops? Is it a subject matter you haven't seen before? perhaps a style, like you were saying, that doesn't feel like it's a documentary, or um, just things you've noticed in the last couple of years, or anything that might strike you as like really innovative or really interesting? I've started feeling like what we do is analogous to sculpting, in a way, and if you guys agree, it's like we get all this material, and then we're sort of cutting, we're weeding away to find what the essential is, is what it feels like for me. So it's sort of, you know, once in a while there's something that you start with, and like, it's, we, we watch in a very unhealthy way, we binge watch, and so there's a lot of stuff that's good. It's like, it's good, it's good, it's good. What, what is a definite no is banal, super conventional. You've seen it before. And you're looking for it, but then you're, there's a lot of respect. People are making wonderful films, and you, you know there's great intent. And you're, you know, every time you're putting in, you're thinking there's so much desire and love and commitment and talent, but it's sort of like, it's OK, it's OK, it's OK. And then something gets your attention that's more than that. It transcends it. It's extra compelling. And it could be, you know, it's not necessarily the subject, although like I know at South by Southwest, certain subjects, we always look for stuff that crosses over with the interactive conference and the music conference. And, and um, you know, we look for cinematic qualities, for sure. Um, uh, but you're, we're looking for great character stuff. You know, we're looking for, for, but you're looking for something that moves you, where there's some sort of emotional transaction, something changes, and where it sort of transcends just the ordinary, even though something like Boyhood, which is sort of uh, not, exact, not a documentary at all, but what's so brilliant about Boyhood, which is my favorite film in my lifetime, is the ordinariness of it, but, but there's a, you know extraordinary talent in how that was done, so I have to be careful in how they use that word. But, so it's something along those lines, yeah. you know, and it's not like you know, it's not... It, so there are certain subjects that some of us may be more fond of, some may be more politically bent, and some may be more, I love art process films personally, I just do, you know, I like, so I have a bias in that direction, but you're just, you're looking for something where the people are, the, the qualities just are compelling, 
and it can come in any number of forms. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, I, I try to recognize my biases, so I'm not necessarily the biggest music doc fan. And I've said that publicly, I've written about it, whatever. What? Music. music docs. Not necessarily my favorite. Um, I still love South by Southwest, and no, I watch them there. <laughs> um, but but, I, but I, the thing is, for me, I mean, it's not like I'm in, instantly going to just disqualify a music doc if it's a music doc. I'm going to watch it. And what I find is if, I'm, if it actually compels me, if, if I'm interested in it, even though I don't know anything about the music, don't know anything about the band, the musician, whatever, um, and yet I find something surprising about it, then that's something where I, I, I recognize my bias, but I'm able to sort of get beyond that. So does it transcend like its conventionality in, in a way? Um, and that goes for any kind of genre, no, not just the music docs, but if it's something that like you're watching it and even if it can be done conventionally, I mean, it can be done like in this sort of standard talking heads way, but if there's something about it which makes you sort of stop and go, wait a minute, like that's not what I expected. Um, they, you know, this filmmaker is doing something very interesting or innovative with that story, then that works for me. It seems like whenever you, you watch a movie where it does all the wrong things, the things that usually you know, push buttons, yeah. and you actually like the film, then you know it's something right. special. For me, Absolutely. You know, a film like The Kill Team is, could be seen as a very conventional Talking Heads film, um, but it's in the performances mm -hmm. in The Kill Team, and it's just in the overall, overall power of it. That it, I guess Robert Greene actually wrote about the very same thing uh, on, his, on his blog. You know, that's... You just, it's undeniable. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I think for me, it's as, it's as simple as storytelling and craft. Um, I think a compelling story, and I'm looking for, you know, documentary is an art form. I want to see really high levels of craft, really good filmmaking. Um, but we have the luxury of having a very big program, so we can kind of get everything in, um, which is wonderful. I mean, we can't get everything in, but we can get a lot in, in terms of like the spectrum of what documentary can do. And we're very lucky in that way. Um, I think the way I kind of approach it is we serve two people, which is the filmmakers, and are we supporting filmmakers that need our help? Um, and can we help those films get out into the world? And our, you know, and our audience, are we showing them films that they are gonna find really engaging? And I think in the back of my mind, those are the two people I'm always thinking about when we're making those choices. I, 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 think, more, I think of more than that. And it's, I feel like every film has a job it has to do. So we have a number of sections. The sections are more conventional, more innovative. There's just a music, there's an international, there's a, from things from the other festivals that stand out. And then it's sort of like, so it's, it's um, whether it's pushing the form or it's doing something artistic, is it gonna be critically acclaimed? Is it gonna be an audience pleaser? Um, is it going to, um, you know, I, I guess I, I guess that's it. I guess, I guess that's the only criteria. But it's like it, there's a because each slot is so precious. It's so competitive, you know. And um, oh yeah, we want we want diversity in budget and tone. So you know we so because we're not a doc festival, but you would want that anyway. You want funny. You want scary. You want sad. You want provocative. So we're painting as programmers. We're painting a picture, a full picture. Now we're the only people who know what it is. We're the only people that have seen all the films in it. But that's what we're doing, you know, and we, we want a variety of experiences for people. The, the music doc question, not to go to it, but it's like, music docs are exhausting, and there's something about, because South by Southwest started as a music festival, people often say to us, you know, we have the perfect film for you, there's music in it, and we're like, no, that's, that's not the right equation. And there's some music docs are almost all the same. It's incredibly hard to make a good one, so it's actually our most dreaded category to watch, because we get hundreds of them, and it's like, there were some friends, we formed a band, we went on the road, we got into substance abuse problems, and then we split up, you know? And people always be like, this will just be perfect for South By. Yeah. And then it's like, do you like this. The Who, or do you like, I don't know, Joni, I mean, it's sort of like, do you like, it depends on which is your favorite band, and you know, and so it's very hard to make one that, that transcends, but there was a film like Pulp that we made last year, that we showed last year, that was sort of like so much about place, and, and place, and characters, and people, and you know, the creative process. And so it's like, it's very exciting when, when music films are better than all the other ones that they're exactly the same of. I mean, they just are the same film over and over again. So are sports docs, typically. But again, with, and I'm, I'm, it's another one yeah. for me, sports docs, when they do something different and they transcend just like who's going to win, like it's that kind of basic competition sort of uh, doc subgenre. But if it transcends that, it transcend is the right word, I think, generally. Like if the film is doing more than what you think on the surface that somebody would assume it would do then it's something that sort of stands out. Absolutely. So getting, getting to the sort of nitty gritty of, of the curator's art and the existential crisis that we, we face uh, from time to time, I, I feel it at least once a year where it's like, 
can't anyone make a good film anymore? It's like you, you have to hit rock bottom and then you, you get brought up by these, these transcendent works. How, what do you all do to sort of clean your palates after seeing, you know, not the transcendent films over and over and over again, you know, after you've seen 30 films that are just okay or mediocre or whatnot. What's, what's your, your personal practice do, to sort do, of do you really, you, honestly, get reinvested? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would like honesty. I, I, I watch um, really, I, I watch uh, streaming bad like British baking shows. That's what I do. <laughs> Specifically British baking. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. American baking doesn't do not it. So much, not so much. Okay. It just, it, it absolutely does just like, it lets my brain turn off for a second and just kind of be open to whatever I'm gonna do next. All right. I wish I don't have the, oh. <laughs> um, this is really embarrassing. Um, I row, I knit, and, because everything has to be within the scope of like, in front of my TV, so I you're, guess. You're, you're rowing out <laughs> you on knit the... And, you can knit, you can knit and I can't screen. knit and row at the same time. This, this um, lake right out here, that's what you're rowing on? No, at home. So I'll watch, say, like House of Cards, and I'll binge watch that ah. to clear my mind, and I'll row at the same time. Oh, okay, this is uh, indoor yeah. rowing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Everything, they're all sitting activities. British people are very good at sitting activities. So. <laughs> <laughs> our, our screening load is so intense, I actually can't afford to watch anything that's not... Um, a programming under program consideration between basically when I go home from here and um, the end of uh, in the beginning of February, but I have the luxury of switching between doc and narratives. Um, so I, what I do is I split it up. You know, so it's like I get sick of the docs, I watch fiction films, and then I that kind of a thing. Uh, right, this row right here. I'm wondering if I'm wondering if uh, there's a documentary that each of you or yeah, let's say documentary that each of you has turned down, which you later had deep regrets about? Deep regrets or slight regrets? Well, you, you, no, I, no, you decide. I, I'll start. Um, there was a film uh, that played at uh, Sundance that had a, what I thought was a very unappealing title at the time, Iraq in Fragments. I didn't go see it. I don't know why. And then found out it was one of the great documentaries of the last 10 years at that, that point, the James Longley film. So that was embarrassing. I, no, no deep regrets, but I was just telling them backstage about something I'm not gonna name that I have slight regrets upon and I'm gonna try to remedy. So once in a while, we, we, there's a reason we turn down a film one year and then we, there's a different context that's following that we'll actually go ahead and accept it the following year, even though it's played in other places because there's a different context, there's a different reason. So, um, um, but yeah, but no, um, luckily, happily, because that's what your fear is as a programmer. Your fear is, that, that's exactly what drives you, is that you're gonna either not see yourself or you're gonna miss something that you would have loved and you would have loved to have shown that would have been amazing for your environment. Because we're all programming to our environments too, so there are films that I love that we don't show because it doesn't work in our, our particular setting. But. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, I mean, you know, we are friendly. I mean, gener generally we're friendly uh, colleagues and we talk to one another about what we've seen. And um, there are films that I've seen that may not be appropriate or may not absolutely make the cut for, say, a Sundance or for whatever, but um, they feel like they're more, they're going to work and shine in a bigger way for South by Southwest or whatever. And they're, they probably already submitted to South by, South by Southwest and Janet knows about them, but I'll share a list of films with, with, with uh, Janet and say, I like this for whatever reason we didn't come to a consensus on it or, you know, whatever, and, you know, it goes on to win there. Um, so, you know, those things happen. Um, for me, I mean, we're, we are really lucky in that we now have our own documentary cinema, so if I have those kind of one, I mean, there's always, you know, a good 20 or 30 films, I'm like, I wish we could have got those in. So it's really nice to be able to, either on our screening series or in the cinema, try and get them back. Um, the ones in terms of the festival that really are painful for me are the shorts, because we pair shorts with features. So we'll often find shorts that we really love that we cannot find the right pairing. Um, so Story for the Modelings, which you guys showed, is one of those ones I'm just, we just couldn't find the right pairing. Um, so it's the shorts that stay in the back of my mind, just because those filmmakers need us um, a huge amount too, and they're often some of the most innovative and creative work. So they're the ones that's kind of sit with me. We have curated shorts programs, but it's funny, one of the things I did when I took over the festival is I stopped the practice of putting shorts in front of features because as somebody who'd been a producer's rep for a long time, I felt I'd been in so many situations when our features were harmed by the short. And even though the, I understood what the programmers were doing, I, it's, it's interesting that it's like a, a personal thing that I, I, we don't do at our festival. I just uh, heard a story from Telluride. I don't know if I should say this, but um, uh, 
Werner Herzog was extremely irate uh, about the short that played before the look of silence at Telluride. I will not call out the short, but it, it's, it's just sort of a funny, funny little animated short. But he, he was actually yelling at the, uh, the programmers about it. So there, it is fraught with danger. Um, I want to talk about the, the community. It, is, it maybe sounds like a, an overblown word, but do, do you all think there is a documentary community that you're part of? Yeah. Or, or, or does that more indicate that we, we, uh, we have developed cliques at this point where you know, we know, you know a few dozen filmmakers who've done good work over the last many years and we're, we're preferencing them. Could you, there's a lot of questions in what I just asked, so take it and run with it however you'd like. I mean, certainly. I, I think that there are, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm in New York and so there are tons of documentary filmmakers that are based in New York. There are lots of different kinds of events that happen where documentary filmmakers are there, either other festivals like Tribeca or Independent Film Week, which is coming up next week, um, et cetera. So you do see a lot of, the do a lot of documentary filmmakers around. We do a, a panel series where we draw a lot of sort of more uh, emerging uh, kind of filmmakers um, to sort of learn more about their craft. Um, so yes, for sure, I think that that, that, that exists. I don't know that we necessarily pref over preference um, them. I mean, if you, work with filmmakers and you like their work and you, you know, you've shown it and supported it, you want to know what the next thing they're going to do is and you're you know, going to absolutely be curious about it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to show it if it's not good. Um, sadly, we've, you know, we've had to do that before, not show something that is by somebody that we've supported in the past. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think... Yeah. So to sort of expand on the question, and hopefully you can both jump in, what is your role in terms of, say, giving feedback uh, to filmmakers, people you either know a little bit or a lot or even newcomers. I know... Well, can we, if, can we, can we because that's a different subject, can yeah, I jump in on the community, yeah, jump in on on the community thing things, first? Yeah. The community, I, I mean, I, I think absolutely there, there's a filmmaking community, there's a doc community, it's sort of, and one of the things we love at South by Southwest is how the community and, and all the festivals that we're involved with, that's part of what's happening there. It's how people get to kind of be inspired by each other, how they start collaborating, how they work together, how they kind of help each other. I was late coming here for a few minutes because I just ran into to, you know, an incredible Dutch documentary filmmaker and a Toronto filmmaker and I wanted them to meet. Like they, they had never met before and it was essential that they meet each other because they've had these incredible paths and so, so you want that, you know. And um, it's one of the things we see each other, was move like here, we, we sort of, they're these movable feasts where we can kind of join up and kind of continue the conversation and, and it's incredible to like, you know, to really be engaged with people that care about the same stuff you are. You look at the career of somebody like Laura Poitras who got her, you know, used to work as a night editor on a TV show I was involved with and kind of look at the extraordinary work that she's done or a guy like Howard Gertler worked in the same thing and kind of like watching his evolution. I just, you know, I've been watching them grow up and it's sort of like this is two out of thousands of people that are like, it's very exciting and it's very exciting to see the paths cross and so I, I, I love the community aspect of it and I think it's a, a really big part of it. Um, there are aesthetic cliques. There are there are some people where sort of people are bound by having a, a more one kind of a taste than another. But I think the community is larger than that, and um, I think it's great. And I, you earn your way in by producing work. And I think in these days when economics are, um, this it's a broken system, and it's not really economically viable for most the grand majority of everybody who's making any kind of films. One of the biggest payoffs is. Being in, um, being part of this community of of other talented individuals, and being part of that dialogue. So, could just the follow up that I wanted to ask: what what is your role in terms of feedback? Do you do you feel like you have a responsibility to certain filmmakers or a number of filmmakers, or you know, where where does your your role end, begin, and end? Well, we the the, the program the, the submissions are so they're so daunting. They're up fifteen percent again this year. They're well over doubled in the six years I've been doing this. It's like we are really under the gun. We're getting thousands of films. We have to turn around in an extremely short time. So I, we almost never give feedback during during our programming process. I used to love doing that. I loved being involved with filmmakers who cared about it. But now there's not time to do it. Although we tell filmmakers that they're welcome to get back in touch with us. People who have submitted with us, they can get back in touch with us after April first, and we will share the feedback that we have. 
you know, um, but it's not, I know at a smaller, perhaps at a, at a le if things were less hectic, I could imagine a more fruitful, engaged conversation. And once in a while, there's a reason where I'm compelled that I find myself engaging with a filmmaker and talking to them, but it's extremely rare just because I do literally don't have the time. Yeah, I mean, I, my kind of personal rule with feedback is I'll give feedback on an unfinished cut, but not on a finished cut. Um, because my feeling is a filmmaker should make the film they want to make. And, f you know, films don't get into festivals for so many reasons, and I think in terms of why we didn't take a film, there's never a satisfying answer. So if it hasn't been finished, it's kind of, I try and give helpful feedback, but I certainly would never want a filmmaker to change a film based on my opinion, ever. They should be making the film they want to make. Any, anyone else out, out there? Um, yeah, the, the popularity of film festivals, it seems to be rising. And um, I just, I, for, the, for the audience, and I know that you get a lot of submission, submissions, you were just mentioning that. Um, are you profitable as festivals? <laughs> and if so, are you, is any of that money going back into production or the community? Good, good question. I'll, I'll just quickly uh, talk about the, the true-false story. I mean, we're, like we said earlier, it's 12 years in. We are profitable. We actually are on a, a pretty good path to paying staff um, in a way that we... Yeah, that sounds like a euphemism. We, we really do underpay. But um, there is hope that in the next few years that we'll actually be doing real, real world salaries for a very small amount of people. Um, and we, we benefit greatly from a thousand volunteers, which seems absurd, but we, we do have a thousand volunteers at this point. Uh, we've started to, uh, we, uh, we undertook a, um, an initiative called the PTA program, the Pay the Artist Initiative. Um, it's a bit controversial probably on stage, so we, we most likely won't have time to get into a debate about it. But the idea is that within three years, we're going to pay a $1,000 appearance fee for each feature filmmaker who will be attending the festival uh, along with their film. We started at $450 this year. The idea being that um, we hope would be an inspirational model so that when uh, directors go out on the circuit, you know, 10, 15, 20 festivals a lot of times, that they will come back with money instead of being deeper into debt. So we, we feel like it's an important um, signal that festivals should be part of that economic structure and, and help filmmakers, you know, be it in for the long haul to, to have a, a so-called career making films well, well beyond their passion projects that start, start the, their career. Go. You, both, you both wanted to jump in. Here. Go? I mean, I think this is a real hot issue in documentary right now um, and in festivals at large. Um, I think I'd like to reframe the debate that we're having about this a little bit in terms of what value festivals can offer. Um, because there are a lot of festivals that are just showcase festivals that do not offer the filmmaker anything that supports their career. And they're just showing the film and they're making money off ticket sales. And I think filmmakers should absolutely demand that they get a screening fee or they get travel paid. Or, you know, they should not have to just give their film away to an audience. I do completely agree with that. I also do think, though, that there are different kinds of values that festivals can bring. Um, in that, you know, at Hot Docs, we want filmmakers to really benefit from showing their films with us. And, you know, we try and work as hard as we can that they will either sell their film or we'll help them get international sales or we'll help them sell their next film. Or, you know, we hope that we are a marketplace that is much more beneficial than us just giving them a couple of hundred dollars. We want to help their careers. We've had filmmakers have huge series, which are nothing related to the film they're showing, being picked up during the festival. You know, that's more, that's three years worth of work those filmmakers had over a couple of hundred dollars that we could have given them. And so we're really looking into, uh, you know, what is the value that we can bring to the documentary industry? You know, we also pay for travel, we pay for accommodation, we try and make sure that the atmosphere they're walking to, into in the festival is the most valuable. Um, to be able to give them just cash, we would probably have to lose those things, and I think that would be a real shame. So it's always trying to make that balance of, you know, how are we helping? We never want filmmakers to be out of pocket with us, which I think is a huge issue. You shouldn't have to be out of pocket. Um, you know, and I think festivals offer different values, so I want filmmakers to be better engaged and better understanding of what they're walking into so that they have the most beneficial festival run for their film. 
South by Southwest is a privately held company that um, the film part is the smallest part of the event. So it started as a music event in 1987, and it was a kind of at the heart. It's a trade show, uh, and it was a way for bands to artists to kind of connect with industry so they could learn about the business. This was 1987, pre-internet. A lot of awesome musicians just didn't have a clue. Uh, film and Interactive started in 1994. Um, we are a huge economic, have tremendous economic in Impact on the city of Austin. I believe we're the most significant um, economic engine in Austin. We bring the most money in. Um, in terms of, we don't pay for any expenses for filmmakers. Um, the, the competition filmmakers get a, sti a stipend, but for the most part, we don't travel in or lodge the filmmakers. We set a stage, so it's sort of somewhere between. You know, you've got you've got Paul at one end, and then you've got. Um, Charlotte in the middle, and then we're sort of like the other side of like, it's extremely DIY. We're setting this environment that's unlike any other in the world where there's opportunity to take advantage of, um, but it's very much for the filmmakers to have to access. And so we sort of set the stage and we're, we're sort of get all the players there, but we are not helping people financially participate with us. So the but, they're, but they're getting, the, there are life changing things that happen for, for people there. So, so what South, West, South by Southwest can offer is big press uh, presence, potentially deals being made, um, and lots of sort of high-end connections. Is, would that be? Absolutely, and part of, yes, and more, I mean, you're, you're, getting, you're getting a great, people love the audiences, they love the audience experience, which actually all, all those festivals have the same thing, but people kind of get, they like that, the actual experience of presenting their film in that environment. But yes, it's who they get to meet, um, it's who gets to see their films and the possible opportunities. And then what's interesting, a very, what we hear about a lot too is by people program off of our curatorial decisions. So, so maybe you know, there are a lot of people that aren't at South by Southwest, but because we have chosen to show the film, they also will then follow up on the film or be interested in it or follow the filmmaker or opportunities will come their way just by the nature of being included in our program. So just to be the, the devil's advocate, South by Southwest, like you say, is a huge economic engine in Austin. Why not set it out as a goal that five or ten years from now, you know, in addition I'm, to all the other good things, that you would actually pay for travel expenses? Because I, I'm not a director level of my company. I'm not one of the owners. I'm not a partner. I'm a department head. And it's not in the DNA of the people that own the company. It's like they're not. They have, they have, they have two, they present 2,000 musicians in four days. And there are an interactive people would pay, people would pay a high amount of money just to have a presence there, and so you've got thousands of other you've got a thousand interactive sessions in four days. We're showing maybe 133 features and 110 films. We are the smallest part of it, so it's something that I, um, you know, it's actually just not in my under my control, and it's not part of the DNA of the company. Basil, did you? Uh, I mean, uh, it is it is a conversation that is very complicated and uh, you know on one hand yeah I agree with Charlotte there are festivals out there that um, again I, I can kind of go back again to my um, LGBT festival background sort of niche festivals like that often you know you're doing those kinds of you're doing those kinds of festivals um, uh, because it's serving some kind of purpose other than just a film festival it's sort of social gathering etc in that case we did have a uh, sort of um, uh, screening fee budget and we would pay filmmakers to show their films. Um, not every filmmaker, but it was something that we understood that we kind of had to do sometimes. Uh, we, we desperately needed lesbian films, let's say, so we, you know, those, the, the lesbian filmmakers knew that and they made sure we paid for them. That's great. Um, you know, there's less of an economic model within the LGBT festival circuit, for example, that means that we could guarantee lots of press or that we could guarantee uh, distribution or anything like that. Within the, within the context of documentaries, I think it's much more general um, and there, there is more of a marketplace and so there is benefit to things like, like Charlotte saying for sure. I mean, what she didn't mention is, you know, the, the forum happens at Hot Docs where every single uh, commissioning editor and, you know, person of note is there from the industry who is a potential meeting, who is a potential person that could purchase your film or work with you in some way. For, for Doc NYC specifically, um, you're New York City. New York City is, uh, it is a place that has a million things going on at any given moment. It's not very easy to get your films shown there, even though there are a lot of different festivals. There are a lot of tiny festivals. Um, but you show your film in a tiny festival, you're probably not going to get much, much coverage uh, press-wise, and you're not likely to uh, attract buyers or anybody in the industry to see your work. So what we can offer, you know, there, you know, Doc NYC 
has not only me, but it has the IFC Center behind it, um, and IFC in general, uh, and has Tom Powers, who is you know one of the movers and shakers of the documentary film world. So you know we do not we do not pay uh, screening fees directly, but do we do do honorariums for out of town filmmakers so that they can attend the festival and not sort of go completely out of pocket with that. Um, but we do, we, we, we bring in tons of, uh, tons of local industry to sort of be able to look at their work. We're not talking necessarily that films are gonna get picked up like, sun, like, like they do out of Sundance or South by Southwest, but smaller distributors will and have picked up films at, at um, Doc NYC, so it does make it useful. I just, and what Charlotte said too that was so on point to just reemphasize it again, it's sort of like the nature of the experience and the opportunities that are being offered are actually valued much more than what 500 or even, I think it's great what you guys are doing, but the but it's actually dollar for dollar more value is being presented than, than that equates to. I, not I'm, that we're unsympathetic, it's extremely hard to be a filmmaker these days. It's crazy economically. It's not, a, it is not a smart economic move for anybody. <laughs> it is not, it's just not, you have to know that. No, it's true. Some people do fine, some people break even. I know the Print the Legend guys, we premiered that movie this year, I loved it. They wanted to premiere with us, they wanted to sell to Netflix, they did, they feel great, they're very happy about it. There are people who break even and are fine, but it is, even at, you know, at Sundance, which is, has a high um, percentage, it's, tough going and you have to be you have to be aware of that and you have to be if your filmmakers one of the most important things is don't spend more than you can afford to lose like you have to really be clear about that you have to be understand what you're getting into and you can't have false hopes about it there are wonderful upsides and rewards and tremendous things happens but you can't be deluded about it Charlotte you have the last word on this yeah I mean I think I just I'd love people to realize that filmmakers you know festivals are not pulling in all this huge amount of money and we're all dancing around it at the end being gleeful that we've stolen from the filmmakers you know we most of us are non-profit arts organizations and we are so passionate about filmmaking and everything we do is thrown back into the festival for what we can do for filmmakers and I think you know if you meet anyone who works at festivals we're driven by that we want to help these films it's why we do what we do so I really hope people realize that the festivals are here to champion filmmakers you know for the that's well, I, I want to thank these very idealistic, well-intentioned, uh, good people. Uh, Janet, Charlotte, and Basil, thanks, thanks to all of you, and, and Tiff as well. And thank you to Paul Sturtz. <laughs>